We are all going through a period of great crisis and the world is reeling under the attack of COVID-19 pandemic. Its repercussions are seen the world over and we are forced to shift our patterns of life, learning and teaching. And that explains why we, why we have shifted from seminars to webinar. And in this webinar, through this webinar, we are trying to address the changes that will be brought in the post-pandemic era in language, literature and culture. Uh, we are having a session on COVID-19 and student engagement in virtual classroom. And this is truly an international session. We have resource persons of uh, different nationalities taking part here. And actually, this is the session that will be handled by our collaborator, academic collaborator in this seminar, the Faculty of Language Studies, uh, Sohar University, Sultanate of Oman. And I'm really uh, grateful to Dr. Roy P. Wittel, who has been instrumental in uh, making this academic collaboration a reality. And this is how we are going to proceed with the session. Dr. Roy uh, will initiate the discussion and he will be talking about COVID-19 ELT meeting the challenge and he will speak for some 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, he'll be followed by Dr. Christine D. D. Leon uh, who will be speaking from the, from the same place. Uh, they are uh, in the same office now and uh, the third part of this session will be handled. That will be on uh, online assignments and that will be handled by Dr. Junifer Abatayo who is currently in Philippines. He is joining us from Philippines. So coming to Dr. Roy, the first presenter, Dr. Roy P. Wittel, uh, that is how he is known in the academic circle, but we would like to uh, address him by the full name, Roy Pushpa Vilasam Wittel, because that was a fascinating name when we were in college. He was uh, my senior and Sri Hari's classmate. And he is an assistant professor of applied linguistics at Sohar University at present. Uh, his academic credentials include a PhD in uh, applied sociolinguistics then of course he has an MA in English literature and a beard in English and he has to his credit the Cambridge CELTA certificate a PGCT and he is the IELTS train the trainer certificate holder from the British Council uh, he has authored a book entitled changing paradigms of English language teaching and the Department of English Pioneer College uh, uh, is very proud that we were able to release that book uh, last time when he was uh, in India last year, I mean. And he has also uh, contributed several book chapters and published in Scopus Index journals. And uh, he has presented papers in uh, many international seminars also. So I don't want to uh, continue with the formality any longer. Straight away, uh, I request uh, Dr. Roy P. Wittel to speak on the topic COVID-19 COVID ELT meeting the challenge. Over to you, Dr. Roy. Your mic, your mic. Your mic your... OK, so let's proceed. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Sandosh, uh, for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, in fact, I am elated a little. Uh, uh, what to say? Your words have taken me back to the campus. <laughs> I feel quite young now, like I was there in the 80s. The 80s means uh, in the last, in the second part of the 80s. Let people not think that I'm too old. So thank you very much once again for your kind uh, introduction. Uh, before I start my talk, uh, on behalf of all of us here at the faculty of language studies Sohar University uh, let me extend a warm welcome it's quite warm here in Oman so I think warm welcome must be the most appropriate way to welcome you all uh, to this session uh, jointly organized by uh, Pioneer College and the Kerala Research Council and the Faculty of Language Studies uh, Sohar University uh, I think uh, someone who spoke before me, I'm sorry I forgot the name, has rightly mentioned that we are not talking about uh, the post-COVID scenario now. Uh, actually, our focus is more on uh, not the post scenario, but the while uh, scenario, that is the present uh, scenario 
the COVID-19 scenario uh, and uh, student engagement uh, in English language classrooms. Uh, but there is nothing wrong uh, in assuming that some of the elements of uh, the present scenario will continue to remain on stage even after uh, the post-COVID scenario unmasks uh, itself, to use a, a COVID uh, term. So we hope it will unmask very soon, that's our hope. But some of the elements of, uh, like Dr. Ajay Kumar has rightly mentioned, we can, we can rightly assume that there is going to be uh, more incorporation of flipped learning, blended learning, or there is going to be more incorporation of technology uh, in teaching. Because uh, certain things are like that. Once you trigger it, once you initiate them, it becomes very difficult to stop. And I, and I think we have initiated one such move now that is a greater incorporation of technology uh, into teaching. I believe that all of you will agree with me uh, if I say that we are uh, right now in a period of uh, transition as far as the mode of teaching or learning is concerned. Uh, to go back to our literature uh, classrooms, we all intuitively feel that something is slouching towards Bethlehem to be born at last. But as Iliad puts it in his generation, we still have our one hand on the door. And I think it is quite typical of any period of transition. Because on one side, we have our expectations about a new era that is about to be born. Of course, we can have our own expectations. Uh, for me personally, uh, my expectations grew because Dr. Ajay Gumar was mentioning that capitalism might collapse. <laughs> or at least uh, capitalism uh, might not continue in the same form as it is now. So we have our expectations about certain positive things, if I can put it that way, uh, about the post-corona uh, uh, scenario. At the same time, we also have our fears, our anxieties uh, about the post-COVID uh, scenario. And I think these anxieties and these worries need to be addressed. And webinars like these are actually attempts uh, to address those fears and anxieties. Now, if we look at uh, the present scenario, the questions about, let us say, the absence of the teacher in the classroom and also the absence of the student community in the classroom. The pre-corona classroom scenario, if I can put it that way, or the traditional concept of teaching is based on a very strong premise, which I personally believe in. And the premise is that the physical presence of the teacher and the physical presence of the student community in the classroom, these two things are important if the learners are to receive uh, again, to use COVID terms, the vitamins and the nutrients necessary to make them not immune uh, to language acquisition and language learning. And I think these are the two things that we are going to miss or we are missing uh, in the current or in the present scenario. Now, let us see why the physical presence of the teacher is important in the classroom. The physical presence of the teacher is important because the teacher has a great role to play. Whether all the teachers play that or not is a debatable issue. But ideally speaking, uh, the teacher, the physical presence of the teacher makes a big difference. When there is someone in flesh and blood in front of you, interacting with you, it can make a lot of difference. The teacher basically is the facilitator of learning and learning development in the classroom. And how does the teacher facilitate that? The teacher facilitates that by becoming a co-participant of knowledge, uh, because he is a co-participant in the creation of knowledge. 
as Vyotsky puts it, you know, knowledge is created, it is constructed. So that is what he says in his theory of social constructivism. We'll come back to that later. So the teacher plays a role in co-constructing the knowledge together with the students. He can negotiate meaning and he can support students in uh, negotiating meaning. He also plays or he also takes care of the affective factors very much required in the classroom. Because we, as we all know, uh, we have heterogeneous, uh, I mean, classroom set up in the sense we have students with multiple intelligences. Students do not have the same, uh, let us say, pace of learning or they do not have the same ability to learn. Uh, some are quick learners, some are slow learners. Uh, some students need to be motivated. They need a lot of not motivation before they can be initiated into any kind of activity. And some students are already motivated and we need to, as teachers, we need to maintain their motivation. So these are certain affective factors. Some students need to be uh, encouraged some students need to be appreciated some students need to be rebuked we call it the stick and carrot method so these affective factors are actually taken care of by the teacher so he motivates the students and it is again for the teacher uh, to give feedback on what the students perform and it is again for the for the teacher to evaluate uh, you know the performance or the linguistic uh, what you can call acquisition, the level of the linguistic competence of the students in the classroom. All these things are taken care of by the teacher. And that is why we say the physical presence of the teacher in the classroom is of paramount importance. And that is something that we will be missing when we go online. And that is a challenge that we need to address. And the second part of this premise is that, uh, or is, uh, is basically about the presence of the student community in the class. And why is the presence of the student community in the class so inevitable? Because as I mentioned before, knowledge is constructed, rather knowledge is uh, co-constructed. And how does that happen? It happens through face-to-face -face interaction because students involve themselves in debate no, there will be arguments and let us say it happens through argumentation, it happens through negotiation. All these things play, critical pedagogy basically, all these things play, of course, a big role in, in the construction of knowledge, rather in the co-construction of knowledge. And that is why we say uh, knowledge is actually a cumulative product, if we can put it that way. So you derive meaning, you come to consensus, you come to negotiation, you build on, you create. And the same thing also uh, is applicable uh, when it comes to the acquisition of skills, not only about knowledge. How do we develop a skill? Can you develop a skill in isolation? I think linguistic skills are developed not in isolation, but they are developed, let us say, in tandem. You need other people to cooperate with you. When I speak, I need someone to listen to me. And if someone is listening, it implies that somebody is speaking to them. When someone writes, of course, the writer expects a reader. Let us, I mean, basically speaking, it is through interaction. It is in tandem that we uh, acquired uh, language skills. And for that reason, the physical presence of the student community is also important. And now when we go online, when the mode of delivery of lessons uh, become online, this is again something uh, that we will be missing and we need to uh, address that. Uh, when I was talking about this, one of my friends raised the question, what about Buddha? Uh, Buddha was totally independent learning in the sense, uh, we know his was renunciation and the later enlightenment sitting under the Bodhi tree. But then the answer is again, uh, of course, there was renunciation and there was enlightenment, but basically he had to interact with the society. If he had not interacted, if he had not seen the miseries and the sorrows of the people in the world outside his palace, that was, uh, I would say, a kind of interaction. 
with the society which actually led him to uh, the renunciation and and later uh, the enlightenment so basically interaction in whatever form it is is important uh, if language is to be acquired and if uh, knowledge is to be uh, constructed so let us have a brief look at uh, i will not be elaborating on this part briefly what research says about uh, online uh, learning a study done by munir and levy in 2020 that is this year says that students uh, doing uh, their courses online experience a sense of isolation and disassociation with the institution and this is a challenge they complain that they feel isolated they feel disassociated with the institution there are so many things i think dr ajay kumar was talking about uh, the experiences that you get from the campus i also saw someone typing the question what will happen to student politics what will happen to student unions so you know these are all kind of uh, experiences that we get from the campus and these are things that we will be missing let us uh, just think about you know when things become online when when classes go online we have lot of nostalgias about our campuses and we have lot of idols created in our minds when we speak about teachers we speak about the so called ammini teacher uh, i think only uh, uh, carolites can understand the real nuance or the connotation of that expression so what will happen to our much idolized much celebrated uh, concept of ammini teacher and i heard uh, sri hari uh, once talking about uh, let us say muraliam and i still remember the wimber of uh, professor john c at least some of you uh, know him i still remember when some of the plans in front of his department were approved there was a, a big scene created on the campus and i had witnessed that i still remember his wimber what he said was something like this in malayalam you have approved not my plans but you have approved the dreams of my children buried underneath beneath those plans so these are all kind of experiences that you get on the campus campus uh, to put in euphemistic terms is also uh, perhaps a matrimonial catchment area i still remember professor mohammad sali uh, to put it in uh, lighter way i remember him talking about the so called panjara mukhs so you have lot of experiences that you gain from the campus you have the student politics you have the student unions which actually give you some kind of experience uh, in uh, taking part in democratic practices in practicing democracy uh, i think post conari i mean uh, even in the post uh, corona scenario democracy will exist i i hope so when you go online these are all kinds of experience that we will be missing and that is why we say when we speak about education we say education is what you forget or what you remember sorry education is what you remember after you have forgotten all that you remembered so it is what you remember after you have forgotten all that you remembered for the exam so after you forget all that you remembered or memorized for the exam what still remains with you is the real kind of education and that is perhaps very often uh, not inside the classrooms i think uh, some of you will agree with me very often it is outside the uh, classroom so these are you know the, the experience of the campus we are going to miss it and this is something that has to be bridged when we go uh, for online uh, classroom teaching and another challenge that we face now was right was mentioned before it is again the the uh, what you call the digital divide which already exists in the world and with this kind of you know with this online mode of delivery of classes it is going to affect it is going to adversely affect rather uh, you know the the digitally the technologically marginalized section of the society 
the kind of division it can be class division it can be societal divisions based on caste creed you know the location urban rural we have so many economic differences all those differences exist uh, in, in in our society which is it, it is a truth it's, it's a reality and this will also have you know its replications it, its reflections you know when we go on digital mode how many uh, people will have access to the internet how many uh, people will be uh, able to afford laptops and expensive mobile phones there is always a difference between a student who uses a very what you call a very ordinary mobile phone with the basic uh, features and a student uh, who can afford to have a laptop with you know uh, the modern devices and all, all those things so that will certainly lead to what you call the re-cementing of or the strengthening of what you call the digital divide that already exists in the world. So we need to keep that also on mind uh, when we go for uh, what you call uh, online uh, classes. Another issue which perhaps encapsulates one of the most uh, or one of the worst fears of online courses is academic integrity. I think Dr. Jennifer Abatayo will be uh, elaborating on that, uh, that issue. So how do you make sure that when you get, you know, uh, a question answered online by the student, uh, how do you make sure that it was answered by the student? If there is an audio presentation, if, if the assessment is a presentation, an oral presentation, how do you uh, make sure that it was uh, uh, presented by your student. Of course, if you are really familiar with the voice of your student, you can identify the student. But in a classroom with uh, something like 200, 300 students, sometimes it happens, it becomes almost uh, humanly impossible to identify the student by her or his voice. So that is another issue. So you have also issues related to the academic integrity or plagiarism related uh, matters. Do we have cultural issues? I don't know whether it is there in India, but in many cultures, of course, it is here in Oman, we have certain issues related to culture. Uh, because some students, especially female students, are not willing uh, to be video recorded. They do not want to show their face on video recordings. It is maybe a cultural, not maybe, it is a cultural issue. And as teachers, when we upload videos for the students to watch or to listen to, we have to be very careful about the expressions uh, used in that video. And we also have to be very careful about the dress code of the speakers or those who are presenting that video session, because uh, it can lead to cultural uh, issues. Again, uh, pragmatics of the speakers will always vary depending on the cultures they come from. For example, uh, if you are listening to a British speaker and if the British speaker says quite good, what do we think? What, what, what do we understand? Non-native speakers of English. When a British speaker says quite good, uh, most of us understand that yes, he meant it is good. It is quite good. But actually what a British speaker means is a bit disappointing. It is not a positive uh, comment. It is rather a negative comment. And when he says again, that's not bad. When a native speaker or a British speaker says that's not bad, most non-native speakers take it as, oh, he is congratulating me. He is appreciating me uh, for my work. But that's not what he does or she does. Uh, the speaker means to say that's actually poor. The performance is not satisfactory. It's not up to the mark. It's quite poor. That's what he means. And again, if the native speaker, especially British speakers, when they say, I almost agree, we think, oh, he has, you know, uh, come in terms with what I said. He agrees with what I say. But what he means is, I don't agree at all. So the, there are there can be, I mean, the list of examples can go on and go on. I have just given you a few examples to show, uh, to mention the cultural, the pragmatic related affairs. I mean, issues when you go online and when you are listening to speakers of uh, different varieties of English. 
and finally and perhaps most importantly to me is the question what will happen to me as a teacher when everything goes online is it going to affect the teaching profession quantitatively and also qualitatively uh, thank you dr ajay kumar for your uh, reassuring and consoling words because you said the chalk and talk method will continue you have given us uh, hope by saying that because we believe that we will continue to remain on stage or else if everything goes online maybe we have to change qualitatively because the number of teachers already there is a talk in the air about staff cut let it not happen but that is also one issue in question so maybe teachers will have to diversify in their profession they will have to find out you know different modes and different pastures that is also but that is also an issue that remains so i have just highlighted three four uh, issues related to or the challenges related to the present scenario of online teaching now how can we bridge these gaps or how can we uh, address these issues dr christian will be talking about that when he explains how we do uh, our online mode of delivery of classes here keeping in mind all these issues so we need to keep in mind that we need to make the students feel at home we need to reassure them uh, that we are with them so we need to support them how can we do it uh, christine will be elaborating on that we need to keep in mind that there are two parts of this one is quality assurance at the same time let's not forget that this is a kind of crisis management so we are in a crisis we need to manage the crisis but not at the cost of uh, quality quality has to be assured maintained so we need to develop a framework that will match with uh, the mode of teaching that we are doing now that's also important so we need to the question here is now are we going for native online classes or are we going to replicate the traditional teacher student community are we going to replicate you know that mode of uh, teaching i think this is what we should be doing because it's a period of transition we cannot completely do away with that and therefore in a way we need to come out with a framework of delivery of classes which will replicate uh, what you call the kind of teaching that we have been doing uh, before the present scenario so we need to have platforms for discussion to develop critical pedagogy to to encourage debates and interaction with the students we need to motivate and support the students and we can do that in different ways emojis and these and that christian will be talking about that so in addition to all these challenges i think uh, online mode of teaching also has a lot of advantages the most notable advantage that we have seen is that it takes away it 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 removes uh, what you call the inhibition of students to interact with other people because when you are opening your mouth or when you are coming out with your ideas there are so many things involved maybe you have inhibitions regarding uh, how worthy my idea is also you have inhibitions because you are worried about the language that you are using to express your ideas all these things can inhibit the speaker in different ways but when we go online this is what we have noticed even those students who were shy to interact in the classroom in the presence of the teacher uh, and the community of students have come out with their own ideas because they can they don't have to reply to a question then and there they don't have to interact with you when you want they can answer your question at their leisure they can uh, check the words that they are using they can check the grammar that they are using so it it actually gives them some kind of confidence which enables them uh, you know to express their ideas so we guarantee or it facilitates in a way the involvement of students uh, who suffer from what you call this kind of psychological this kind of inhibition so this is one advantage another advantage is 
you can choose the physical environment you can you you can study at your leisure you can sit in the place that you want to sit you want to sit under a tree and read the material you can do that so it also has a lot of uh, advantages like that and dr christine will be uh, talking about that in the next session and again another notable advantage that we notice is that it has forced us to collaborate like what we are doing now so we are collaborating with uh, other higher educational institutions other hei's not only within the country it has also encouraged international uh, cooperation so let us break the chain but let us not break this chain of collaboration thank you thank you very much thank you dr raw for an insightful speech about the spirit of transition from a traditional classroom to an online classroom and uh, we will take up the question at the end of the uh, all three sessions okay thank you very much for the invite i'm so happy that i'm going to share our experiences here in the university so the classroom and now we are having this online classroom or we're having this online learning so here in the sohar in sohar university i'll just give you a little bit of background in sohar university most of our students are women so 90 plus percent of our students are women and we only have few boys so just like what dr roy said we have to consider the culture so it's a very challenging for us to do online learning because most of our staff here in our faculty also are men for me it's okay i'm a woman so i can just uh, see my students i can communicate with them all the time but for men they have to be a little bit careful so these are the things that we have to consider here in our university we have what we called moodle we call it s u l m s it's so high university uh, moodle so here even before covid we are already using moodle so we have this online uh, management with students they have to download the files that they need they have to download our lectures or our material so in a way they know how it works but when we got the covid this is challenging for everyone because we have to learn all the features that it has so now we are learning at the same time and we are teaching our students as well so and also uh here in our university in one lecture we can have as many as 200 students so imagine the challenge that we face how can we have a meeting like this if you have 200 students we even have you know problems managing these students when we have the physical classroom so if it is an online i don't think it will be doable to have all these 200 students in in a class and we also have to consider that these students aside from the culture that some of them may not have the internet or they might have internet problems so what is our university doing now because of these challenges we come up with directed remote learning which is what we call drl in in online learning we have the asynchronous and the synchronous so we chose asynchronous uh because of these issues the culture the internet and then of course uh the number of students so here we have a system so the drl is directed it is remote so we have to guide the students on what are the things that they have to do so in this drl we have 
to put materials in our Moodle or in our system. And we start with the key material. The key material has to be prepared by the teacher. It has to be simple. It has to be direct. It has to be focused. So in a key material, we can have a PowerPoint, but it has, it has to be entertaining to the students in a way interactive, even though they are in a PowerPoint or a Word document. So it has to be uh, guiding the students. The second one, we have, of course, the recommended reading. The recommended reading, not all courses would have this, but even in the recommended reading, we don't just dump uh, chapters of books, no. So we choose the best material that we have. Like for example, in one course, or if you are a, a course coordinator, you can only have four, five, six pages for the students. So these materials, they have to be with high quality. And then we have the supplementary materials as well. So here, this can be videos that the students can watch, or you know, we can have online websites as well here. So that, this is just to help the students understand more about the lesson or about the topic. And then we have also what we call the practice material. Now, in the practice material, we as faculty here, the staff, we have to be very, very careful because we have to make sure that the students would be engaged with this material because this is the time where they have to do their activities prior to their assessment. So here it cannot be too long as well. So students should be able to do their, their practice exercise for a day or two maximum. Because after that, at the end of our our task, we have what we call the assessment. The assessment, it will last for two days with uh, 45 minutes only. So each assessment has to be uh, within 45 minutes. So as teachers, we have to design that our assessment will be like around 30 to 45 minutes. But before all of these things, we have what we call the course profile. It's like a syllabus. So here in the course profile, we have what we call uh, the task. In, in this semester, we only have four tasks. So the four tasks will be covering all the things that you should be covering and they have to be focused. So in short, we will cover only four topics, the most important ones. So, and each task, the students would have an assessment. And the assessment can be formative assessment or summative assessment. So in our faculty, most of us will have two formative assessments and two summative. So 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 for the summative, first summative assessment and then another 50 for the, the second summative assessment. Now, with all of these things, we have to make sure as teachers that students are engaged. So they have the materials have to be direct, they have to have a focus, and then once they, they study those materials, they do their assessment for 45 minutes. Very simple. So we have this, what we call the task description. We give this to the student. There in the task description, they have to know what to do. So we guide them. Like for example, we say, read this material. It's, it's very uh, a guided material. And then second, we will say, watch this video. So students, they will know what to do. What is the first step, the second step, the third step, and the last thing that they have to do. So, for two weeks, they will only have one task. In the last two days, they know this already, that the last two days will be their assessment. Now, with Moodle, what else do we have here? We are also using other tools. We have 
um, the WhatsApp, which is very popular to the students. So anytime they can communicate with their teacher because we want to be with the students, even though we're not physically present, but we have to make them feel that we are here, we are supporting them. And then we also use emails. We also have other platforms. Uh, other teachers, they do Microsoft Teams once every two weeks or even uh, what do you call big blue button once every two weeks or once every week. So just to make sure that students are engaged and to make sure that students understand their, their lesson, their topic. So they can just have question and answers. Aside from that, we also have what we call a discussion forum. The discussion forums, the, the teachers can pose questions there and students will just you know, answer them or the students can pose questions and then the teacher will answer the students. So here we have interactive uh, thing because uh, some students, they feel like they are alone. So we just have to make sure like, no, you're not alone. We are here uh, with you. We are helping you. We are trying to make you learn things because the students that we have here, most of them are women. So uh, they feel like this is the only, like going to the university uh, culturally, this is their way of socializing. At home, well, they, they don't have a lot of socialization there. So with this one, with all of these methods here, I believe that students are more engaged and we are happy that we are now in task three, almost done, because we only have four tasks and we receive good feedback from the students and they feel that they are very, uh, they are supported by their teachers. And of course, the teachers, we really work hard for this. Even uh, some of the teachers said like, you know, they could not have proper sleep because students would keep on messaging them, asking for help. So, but we have to do what we have to do as teachers. We just have to help them and make sure that they are learning. So basically these are the things that we are having here. These are the things that we wanna share to the world as well, since uh, I, we believe that we are in a way doing something good we're having a good practice in our university. So thank you very much. And I hope you learned something and probably you get something from our end. And uh, I'm so happy again for the invite of this uh, talk. All right, okay, it's, no worries. So first of all, I'd like to thank um, Dr. Roy, and of course, from your side, for inviting me to speak briefly on online assessment. Uh, this is timely and this is very important these days, especially that um, because of COVID-19, and there are a lot of challenges. And hopefully, right after my talk, I can share valuable experiences and feedback mechanisms on how to develop effective assessment techniques. Um, Please accept my greetings. I am in Manila, Philippines. It's already three o'clock in the afternoon, and I hope our brothers and sisters who are with us now are safe. All right, so I'm going to speak briefly. I actually prepared a, a nine-page PowerPoint presentation, and I'd like to highlight the authenticity and accountability because this is very important. Um, considering the situation this day, we have COVID-19, and the, the advantage of talking about online assessment is that during the traditional classroom, going back to the, the, uh, the normal situation when there was no COVID at all, I'm not saying this is not generalization, but for sure, online assessment sometimes is being neglected by some other institutions. But now that we have COVID-19, I realize that online assessment comes into its um, great form and its own space. All right, 
the title of my presentation I put here, what is our accountability and what is authenticity in online assessment? Because that's also very important. I'll go directly now to the demands of online teaching and learning. Lucretia, I hope that the PowerPoint is there. All right, so these are the demands of online teaching and learning. Are, are we on the same page now? Yeah, sure, the demands of online teaching and learning. There. Can you click please the second page? Next please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Where you can see the colored boxes. Yeah, just go to the next slide where you can see their colored boxes under the title Demands of Online Teaching and Learning. All right, okay. So I'm going to talk about briefly again of what demands of online teaching and learning so that we are in this, uh, in this current situation. I, I mean, I'm going to relate here five. This is based on literature reviews and papers and other reviews around the world. What are the most important demands that teachers should need to know about online teaching and learning? The first one is accountability. Then we have learning outcomes authenticity, students' performance, and the last one is virtual classroom adaptability. Okay, first, when we speak about accountability, um, it's been nice for a teacher, I'm really into technology, technology used in the classroom. Um, good research cannot be replaced with good technologies, but technologies can be replaced with good teachers. But considering uh, the, the present situation, I think there is always accountability in our part as teachers because it's our role, it's our responsibility in how we can help our students achieve the learning outcomes set for them. I'll, I'll, I'll shift next to the learning outcomes. Why I included here learning outcomes? But there is a, now, there is a from a traditional classroom to a virtual classroom. So meaning to say our learning outcome should be careful and correctly in order to fit into the context of our students' needs. Learning outcomes are very important, and we need to be careful because, again, there is accountability in terms of writing our learning outcomes. Often, this is just a black term that be interpreted across many things. But speaking about flipping the traditional classroom into a virtual classroom in that involves distant learners, authenticity of our materials, authenticity of our assessment, based on the instant I'm sorry? Is, it, is that very clear? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, probably because I am in the Philippines and it's kind of far here. I hope um, you, you hear me very well. And I'd like to suggest Dr. Santos right after my talk, if we can share the slides to our previous so they can read. And if they have questions, then you can also um, write email to me, all right? Okay, so I'll continue with the students' performance. Going back to what I said earlier, that there is accountability on the part of the teacher. We need to write our learning outcomes correctly and clearly because we need to make sure that that fits into the context of our students' needs. Then, the authenticity of our materials, teaching materials, plus 
the um, type of assessment that we are going to integrate into the online virtual classroom is also very important in order for us to really understand and determine the actual performances of our students. All right, okay, I talk about virtual classroom adaptability, right? So this is a very good question. This is a very good question that I think all of us should consider because even myself, I use, I, I consider myself as an example. I said, am I ready for the virtual classroom? Mm -hmm. Do teachers receive training? Because we are used to the traditional type of classroom, but I, I know and I understand there are a lot of teachers worldwide who are adaptable to this virtual classroom environment. And again, here comes accountability because that's very important. How about on the student's part? Are they ready for a virtual classroom at, um, kind of session? Are students, um, do they have access to internet? These are very important questions that I think we need to understand and consider in terms of implementing online assessment and other activities for teaching and learning. I, I'd like to go back again briefly about what Dr. Roy mentioned earlier on the issue of academic integrity. And she's, he said that it, it's very challenging, it's very difficult on our part because nobody knows as to whether who wrote and who submitted the assignment or the, the, the output of the student. So again, there are many challenges, but it's good that we discuss it now and we go back to our own virtual classrooms and we need to think on how we can help support students' learning. Okay, I have here an extract of a paper that I have uh, published last month. It's about enhancing assessment literacy with the implication of technology-enhanced online assessment. I have here eight, so I'll go briefly to the tips and suggestions for a technology-enhanced instruction. The first one here is if we use online assessment, we need to make sure that assessments are designed with consistency and uniformity. It should be consistent and it should be uniform. Because remember, we are dealing with distant learners and we are in a virtual classroom. So there is no possibility of having a different assessment design which is not really consistent, which is not uniform. Again, going back to the writing of the learning outcomes, it's, it's very important that it's uniform across or throughout the course or courses. The second one here is, Dr. Kristen earlier, if you, if you recall, she talked about dynamic interaction because it's also very important that it's not just uploading learning and teaching materials in a virtual classroom asking students to submit something without having interaction with them. So make sure that our inter interaction with our students is dynamic. There is dynamism and it should be, there is enthusiasm. Assessments therefore must support intensive and self-motivative evaluative measures of students' achievement. The third one here is, I suggest that we adopt an alternative to and in assessments. Why well, I'm saying alternative to assessment? Because again, it's good that we see our students in classroom. There is a physical kind of talk and we look at our students with their eyes. You see the motivation, the motivation is there. Your presence as a teacher is there. The students can talk to you very easily. But in terms of this virtual classroom instruction, alternative assessments are highly suggested. So there are several types of alternative to and alternative in assessments. But again, if we focus uh, more on the emphasis of the, the importance of the design of the alternative assessment, learning outcomes should be clearly written to reflect skills and abilities to perform. Okay, from the, from the, on the context of authenticity, authenticity, we need to come up with an integrate, an integrate authentic assessment test in all courses. It's not only about language, it's not only about linguistics, it's not only about English language teaching. Authentic assessments can be used online across many disciplines like engineering, sciences, um, nursing, and other things. Okay, but to me, personally, when we say authentic assessment, the question is, what, what, when can you say that the online assessment is really authentic? The word authentic is a blanket term, and it can be interpreted by many scholars around the world. And 
all the participants, now that you are listening to me, we have our very own interpretation. What is really an authentic assessment? And what makes our assessment authentic? So I'd like to, to list and to base the criteria of what is an authentic assessment from Gilmore. Gilmore mentioned that an assessment or even a test can be considered authentic if it is situated into these three important aspects. The first one here is the text itself or the assessment itself. Next is the participants, the participants themselves, the students, their social, their social or cultural situation. And what is the purpose of doing the online assessment? It's not just like we, we face our computer, we write our assessment, we design our assessment just because we, we have an online assessment. We need to consider also the, the, authentic, the, the authenticity measures of our online assessment. Try to understand very carefully whether the material itself or the assessment itself relates our learning outcome to the social or cultural situation of our students and the purpose. So this, this is very important by including all these criteria into our learning and even the standard of our assessment to say that somehow our assessment is authentic. Because there is a integration of the itself. We are doing our assessments as participants of the classroom situation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to me, it looks like from experience, uh, talking from experience, of course, all these things are uh, challenges that we will have to confront if we are to proceed with you know the same mode of uh, delivery of classes but we are not sure that we are going to have the same kind of online delivery of classes uh, even in the post covid scenario hopefully we will come back to uh, you know the teacher student direct interaction mode of delivery of classes as uh, pointed out by uh, dr jay kumar in his opening uh, speech so in that case the current scenario will not exist uh, but assuming that this will continue to remain, the present scenario may not end so fast. And assuming that, uh, you know, the situation will be something like this or online uh, mode of delivery of classes will uh, continue. It will continue to remain there. I would say the most uh, formidable challenge will be what I said there how to guarantee the integrity of your assessments that is one thing you know people who are desirous of learning will learn that is what history has shown if you are really desirous of learning you will learn that is a different thing so but then i also feel the you know the the inflated value the undue value that we now ascribe to marx might disappear that is one possibility you know that is not a challenge but keeping this challenge in mind this is i think it will be a concomitant of this problem as a result of this because uh, people will question the integrity of uh, you know the assessments uh, that if, if you do, you cannot come out with a real solution for that that will remain as a challenge and as a result of that challenge I feel that uh, the importance of marks will disappear. At the end, it becomes your responsibility to learn. That, of course, uh, as a true independent learner, it's always your responsibility to learn. That is why we say teachers are only facilitators. And instead of assessing your worth, depending on uh, what you call the marks, your uh, prospective employers will look at your real competency you will have to prove in the market that you are worthy you will have to prove if i can use the word market you will have to prove to whoever is interviewing you or to your employer that you are competent enough and you are capable of you know achieving the task or doing the job so i think the most uh, to conclude is yes, to answer the question i think this is going to be you know, one of the biggest challenges uh, that will remain uh, integrity with regard to assessments. I hope I have answered.
switch over to online yes yeah. uh, here the question is how you people tackle the mental trauma facing my student wants switch over to online space okay so the students uh, how did we tackle this one we just like what I've mentioned we made sure that the students would feel that we are we the teachers are there for them we supported them in various ways, just like um, what I also discussed. Aside from the Moodle, the system that we have, where it has a lot of functions, we also made sure that we can contact the students through email, through WhatsApp, or other means, just to for them to feel that we are guiding them and we are trying to make them learn and then that we are we are supporting whatever they are going through right now so by just making contact with students i think that would help a lot of things and also dr roy would like to add yeah Dr. Sandosh, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, uh, I would like to add because I think it has got some relevance to uh, what I was mentioning in my talk before. Uh, I was talking about what you call the, the teacher-student rapport, the kind of rapport that exists between uh, students and teachers. I would, I mean, rapport is more related to perhaps what happens inside the classroom I would like to use the word affinity, if that's okay. You know, there are certain, you know, instances where the, the teacher and the student establishes a kind of bond, you know, between them, a kind of affinity. We, we in the beard classes, we used to say teachers are surrogate parents, uh, you know, and sometimes it happens even in the university. Maybe you are an adult student, you are an adult learner uh, who is supposed to be independent in many ways. But there are occasions when you are mentally broke down or you are physically broke down because of many reasons. And there are occasions when teachers come to your help, just like Dr. Christine was talking about it. So teacher supports you not only emotionally, uh, you know, emotional support is there, but they can also support you in different ways. And that is why I, I was reminded of uh, the, if you remember, I used the expression modelium. Uh, it was coined by Srihari some time ago. I think two, three years ago, I happened to read that. It was a Facebook posting done by Srihari. And he was talking about, uh, you know, uh, how uh, Murali Master supported one particular student who was not able to join uh, a tour or a picnic or something like that. That is a kind of support, you know. These are occasions when the students uh, feel isolated. These are occasions when students feel that they are not supported, maybe emotionally, maybe physically. I also remember many other teachers in the background of keeping Pioneer College in the backdrop, you know. Uh, we cannot forget like uh, Karimudur Balagashtan Master, we cannot forget Sri Jagannath Pai, the way he used to support students. And and you, I, I think all of us know uh, Dr. P. Bhaskar and Nair, who is uh, moving around supporting people in that region. So how he has come down to it, we, I would like to call him a Gandhian ELT practitioner, because he is always in the villages. So uh, he is trying to, you know, educate uh, house, uh, housewives. He is trying to open venues for, you know, the, the people in the village. So this kind of support uh, can only be given by uh, teachers. I, I mean, 
only uh, can be given only if the teacher is physically present there. So that is how, uh, perhaps, to add to what Dr. Christine was adding, I mean, talking about, this is how people or teachers can emotionally, even economically, physically uh, support their students. Dr. Sandosh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So for this question, I will answer it. Yes, uh, we need to have a new syllabus for this. Uh, in our university, we made another syllabus. We call it course profile. And we, in this course profile, we have the learning outcomes. And then we have the four tasks. So because we are now having this online, we chose the best topics that we have in our offline syllabus. So just four, straightforward, very direct. And then even the assessments, they have to change as well. That's why we have a new syllabus. Yes, it is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, I think that's a real issue. You know, you always, you will always have uh, such tricky, mischievous, naughty students. Whether it is online or offline, this problem exists. Uh, can you guarantee? I don't know if I am asking a question back to you, Sandosh. I don't know uh, what percentage of attendance you had when you were a student there. Uh, so th this question of <laughs> attendance will always remain. Uh, but then in the Moodle program, yes, in the Moodle program, we have an option. We can see when they joined and whether the students had internet access there. There are certain activities, uh, there are certain activities, certain options are there in the Moodle program that we are using, which will give you a real picture. For example, you, you start an assessment now. So how many students logged in and how many students could not log in? It will show the duration, it will show the time, and it will also give you uh, an online feedback on why they could not, whether their device was not connected to the internet. Those options are there. And as, he, as Dr. Christine mentioned, we have personalized this model program in a way. We call it S-U-L-M-S. That is Sohar University Learning Management System. Yeah. So there you get some kind of feedback. But we cannot guarantee for 100 percent that, you know, there was no kind of uh, uh, what you call mischief involved. But to some extent, of course, we can get a feedback on uh, the, the time they took and whether it was a genuine reason or not. But, you know, loopholes are always there. Hello, uh, Mr. Santosh. I think it is almost time. It is 12.35, I think. So, some 10 more minutes we can remain here, I think. Yes. Yes, Dr. Santosh, that's a very big question here. How do we address, you know, multiple intelligence? How do we uh, address the issue of differently able? Mm. Uh, I would suggest, I would suggest, I think I do not have a perfect answer for that. It is for all of us academics to have a discussion on that and then evolve it. Yes. We need to come out with uh, a practical solution for addressing that issue. But I would say, uh, we can, if possible, we should also think about organizing uh, what you call some group activities. Maybe we can have smaller groups, depending on uh, if you have less number of students in your class, and if it can be done live, some five students coming together with a leader for the group, and the teacher has, you know, uh, the teacher can also join in, and then we can see how the classroom works. That is that that is possible perhaps only when the class goes live where students can also involve so maybe that is one solution uh, to address the differently able people and to address the issue of multiple intelligence i'm not sure whether what i have proposed is a perfect solution i'm sure it is not we need to we need to evolve i do not have a ready-made answer for that 
it is something that need to be i mean need to evolve yeah, that's we, that's it we haven't looked into it doctors but, uh, uh yes uh because in our system here we can give assignments we can give courses to the students and for this the things that we can do is to give different uh tasks or practices to the students depending on their intelligences uh if this will go on so we will really probably doing something like that because at this moment we are just giving one task to the student one assessment one assignment or one quiz so again uh, we don't know when this will end and if ever then we really have to look into how we are to handle different intelligences no. yes yes can i add something yeah going back to the issue or the challenges of this um different types of learners in a virtual classroom in my slides if if, if we have time um kindly share the slides i mentioned there about accountability because that is the purpose of why we need to understand the different types of learners in a virtual classroom because in general sense the students are considered as distant learners so there are a lot of issues that that is involved in terms of that are involved in terms of accountability because that is our responsibility in an online assessment virtual learning environment the alternatives to assessments are highly encouraged the performance types of assessments are highly encouraged because these types of assessments online assessments can generate multiple multiple responses and output from our students it's not only one flat sheet that hey you need to submit this paper to your teachers but if we if we can de develop if we can design a performance type of an assessment which is consistent with our learning outcome then definitely it can generate and help our students to come up with multiple responses that would um, definitely the traditional types of a classroom they are distant learners in a virtual learning environment Director to Dr. Sandosh. Yeah. Uh, it's not completely possible, I would say. That is one of the challenges. That's one of the demerits of what you call uh, offering classes online. Uh, giving what was that individual attention yes uh, because it is if it is food cooked in the same kitchen uh, but served on different plates you know so but what we can do is in the way we support them uh, in the way we interact with the students individually maybe we can take care of some of these issues because like what we have here we have discussion platforms and students can also write to you to your personal uh, or the university email ID and that is uh, a platform where you can have one to one interaction uh, with, with the student. Maybe that is where you can support them. But remember, uh, nothing can substitute, you know, one thing perfectly. There is no perfect substitute for anything in the world. So offering classes in the real classroom will be always different from offering classes online and some of these issues though can be addressed to certain extent will always remain but this is one way in which you can uh, give individual support to students if you if you know that student if you know that there is a student who needs motivation you can you, you can interact with them in such a manner the way you write to them the emojis that you send to them the feed it can be reflected even on the feedback that you give to them in the practice activities etc etc if motivation is what they need and if you think that he is a slow learner maybe you can 
uh, give them more support you can give them more explanation you can have more personal interactions with them you know these are the things maybe uh, possible things when you are doing an online course that's why exactly yeah blending uh, physical and online coaching blending in the sense can we do it in the in the covid scenario uh, is physical presence of the teacher possible maybe after some kind of relaxation i mean after we have a period a relaxed period maybe not to the full extent maybe we can keep the social distancing can we think of that uh, having only 10 students in our class maintaining that physical distance and then uh, deliver classes uh, maybe these are things we can think of yeah can we have with jennifer okay um, can, can, okay yeah, jennifer, can you be uh, the uh, can you start yeah yeah that's a very good question but um, personally, personally, from my very own perspective, the online teaching, virtual environment, is not very new to us because even before the COVID scare came into existence, we do online teaching. We do kind of blended type of learning. So that's a very good practice. I think the way I look at teaching and learning after COVID experience is that um, all of us, I think we have very important role in in developing teaching and learning that can really cater to the needs of our students. Our students these days are considered as, again, I will use distant learners. So there are a lot of parameters in terms of understanding what they need, their, their, their wants in terms of teaching and learning, and of course, on the part of teachers. I'm not sure if you heard me talk earlier about, for us teachers, if we ask ourselves, are we also ready for this kind of education type of education do we receive good training about online teaching so that's a very good question how about students accessibility adaptability and a lot of things so this is a question that i think all of us have good answers and i hope and i pray that in the future after covid everything will be normal and from our own experience and we can integrate we can help ourselves as teachers and continue supporting our students to advance their learning. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sandosh. Yeah, I think uh, Dr. Ajay Kumar had slightly hinted at this. Uh, I think I totally agree with him because I think in the post-COVID scenario, there is going to be a kind of hybrid kind of education i think he used that hybrid because we are going to have plan b in case of a pandemic situation like this again in the future we need to keep our students uh, equipped and another thing is because because the teachers also need to be trained that was also mentioned before i think uh, using technology uh, in education will become you know yeah, exactly so it will become an important part of the training courses uh, because the teachers also need to be uh, trained and prepared for facing uh, such crises uh, if, if at all they happen in the future so i think these are the two things so it will take a hybrid nature with more incorporation of technology and it will also have its implications on training courses i think this will be the effect of the present scenario on the post-COVID scenario. Thank you, Sandosh. And uh, no, I think uh, we don't have time as well. Uh, they said, and, um, I agree with them. The students, they have to be prepared also. They have to be tech savvy as well as the teachers. Because at this moment, we are also learning how to navigate uh, you know, our system, how to do a lot of tricks uh, and how to make sure that with technology, we are still engaging our students. I think that's all. So good afternoon, one and all. Now that we have come to the fag end of the second session of the international webinar organized by the postgraduate department of English, Paino College, Paino, in collaboration with the Kerala State Higher Education Council and Faculty of Language Studies, Soha University, Oman. 
I consider this as my privilege to propose the vote of thanks on this very special occasion. So first of all, on behalf of the Postgraduate Department of English, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Roy P. Wittel, Assistant Professor of Applied Linguistics, Sahai University, a man who initiated the discussion on the topic COVID-19 and student engagement in virtual classrooms. He threw light on the challenges that we are going to experience or right now that we are experiencing in the teaching learning process by providing a suitable instances as well. He also stressed on the importance of incorporating technology into the teaching learning process. Thank you for sharing your valuable insights with us, sir. It is indeed a thought provoking session, especially in the spirit of transition, as you mentioned. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Christine D. D. Leon, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Language Studies, Sahai University, Oman, who talked about her experiences of online teaching and also talked about how to deliver the online classes by introducing as the new systems of learning like DRL. And she also explained to us how to make use of the social platforms like WhatsApp, email, etc. for the effective teaching and learning process. Thank you, ma'am. Now, I would like to thank Dr. Jennifer Abatayo, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Language Studies, Chair and also Chairman at the Center for Educational Development, Saha University, Oman, who talked about the online assessment and how it has to be done effectively. Thank you, sir. Now, a sincere thanks to Dr. VM Sandosh, Coordinator IQAC and also the faculty of the Postgraduate Department of English Pioneer College who delivered the welcome address and also introduced, introduced to us uh, the chief guest of this session. Thank you, sir. Now, I thank Ms. Anju A, the anchor of the session, who with her timely intervention ensured the smooth going of this session. Thank you, Ms. Anju. Now, for the sake of formality, I thank all my colleagues and I'm sure without whose help and support, this webinar would not have been possible. Thank you, one and all. Now, last but not the least, I extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to all the particip participants of this seminar, irrespective of the uh, technical interventions that we had in between. They remained with us throughout this session. Thank you for your wonderful cooperation and thank you for making this session a highly interactive one. And I'm sorry if I miss out anyone. Once again, I thank each and every one of you. Thank you.